This is Mrs. Mafuchi, and it's time to begin to look at the history of the development of the atomic theory. This part should be written in your journal. The development of the modern atomic theory is an extremely important concept in chemistry. A theory is a well-established explanation of some aspect of the natural world based on a body of facts that have been repeatedly confirmed through observation and experiment. A model uses familiar ideas to explain unfamiliar facts observed in nature. A model can be changed as new information is collected. The modern atomic theory, or the modern model of the atom, has changed over a long period of time through the work of many scientists. Each of the scientists built upon the work of other scientists to arrive at a more accurate description of the atom. The current atomic theory is an explanation of the results of many experiments. It is a model that explains the properties and behavior of atoms and is based on many previous models, which were based on the scientific evidence at that time. The essence of the modern atomic theory is that all matter is made up of tiny particles called atoms. Atoms consist of a small, dense, positively charged central core called the nucleus. The nucleus is surrounded by a cloud of high-speed, negatively charged electrons. The electron cloud takes up the majority of the volume of an atom, while the nucleus contains most of the mass. Let's look at where the concept of the atom first began. Look at your handouts on the atom that have been taped into your journals and complete the fill in the blanks. Take extra notes along the side if you have to. Atoms cannot be broken down by ordinary chemical means. The word atom comes from the Greek word atomos, which means indivisible. Democritus was a Greek philosopher who began the search for a description of matter more than 2,400 years ago. He said that the world is made up of two things, empty space and atoms. He thought that atoms were the smallest particles of matter and that there were different types of atoms for different types of matter. His belief was not based on any scientific evidence. Democritus asked, could matter be divided into smaller and smaller pieces forever, or was there a limit to the number of times a piece of matter could be divided? He proposed that matter could not be divided into smaller pieces indefinitely. Eventually, one would reach the atom. He claimed that matter was made of small, hard particles called atomos. This is the Greek model of an atom. Now let's look at Lavoisier. Antoine Lavoisier called the father of chemistry. He studied combustion or the burning of things. He was the first scientist to recognize the importance of making careful measurements. He was particularly interested in measuring the mass before and after a chemical reaction. He was the first to recognize that mass is conserved during a chemical reaction. In other words, in ordinary chemical reactions, matter can be changed in many ways, but matter cannot be created or destroyed. The establishment of this law helped in our understanding that matter which is made up of atoms, could not be destroyed, that atoms are not destructible. This was also known as the law of conservation of matter. Lavoisier discovered that diamond was another form of carbon, like coal and graphite. He discovered that the products of a burning candle and human respiration are the same. Both produce carbon dioxide and water. He discovered that water is made up of oxygen and hydrogen. 
Now let's consider the work of Proust. Louis Proust analyzed the composition of several compounds. He found that they always contain the same ratio by weight of their elements. A given compound always contains elements in the same ratio by mass. For example, he found that table salt always contained 1.5 times as much chlorine by mass as sodium and that water always contained eight times as much oxygen as hydrogen. This became known as the law of constant composition, also known as the law of definite proportions. Let's now consider some problems. Since water always contains eight times as much oxygen by mass as hydrogen, this means that for every eight grams of oxygen, there must be one gram of hydrogen. Eight grams of oxygen, one gram of hydrogen. This can be put into a ratio. Let's now solve the first problem. How many grams of oxygen are in a sample of water that contains three grams of hydrogen? To solve any problem in chemistry, the first thing we write down is the given. In this case, three grams of hydrogen is our given. Write down the given. Next step is to put in the conversion factor. The conversion factor we're going to get from right up there. Eight grams of oxygen with one gram of hydrogen. Now one gram of hydrogen is going to go on the bottom so that the hydrogen cancels out, eight grams of oxygen goes on the top, and we're left with 24 grams of oxygen. This means that if you have a sample of water that contains three grams of hydrogen, there must be 24 grams of oxygen. Let's now solve problem number two. How many grams of hydrogen are in a sample of water that contains 10 grams of oxygen? To solve any problem in chemistry, the first thing we write down is the given. 10 grams of oxygen. Then comes our ratio. We're going to get it from our information up here. 8 grams of oxygen is equal to 1 gram of hydrogen. Since oxygen is on the top, we're going to put our 8 grams of oxygen on the bottom, 1 gram of hydrogen. My oxygen cancels out, and I get an answer of 1.25 grams of hydrogen. That means if I have 10 grams of oxygen, I will have 1.25 grams of hydrogen. Let's now solve problem number three. How many grams of hydrogen and how many grams of oxygen are in 100 grams of water? Wow, this one's a little bit harder. Our given is 100 grams of water. Now, right here, when I have 8 grams of oxygen and 1 gram of hydrogen, what does that mean? That means water must be 9 grams of water. Because oxygen and hydrogen together will make the water. 8 plus 1 is 9 grams of water. There's our 9 grams of water. We're going to put it on the bottom so that it cancels out. And now, let's change it to hydrogen first. 1 gram of hydrogen means 9 grams of water. So we'll put our 1 gram of hydrogen right there. In this problem, we have 11.1 .1 grams of hydrogen. Now there are two ways that we can find out now how much oxygen is in there. We can take our 100 grams and subtract 11.1 grams of hydrogen from it, 
And we'll see that we have 88.9 grams of oxygen in this sample. I can also go back and use my beginning information and do the ratio again. And this time, 100 grams of water times 8 grams of oxygen in 9 grams of water. And when I cancel out the water, I'm left with grams of oxygen, and I calculate, and I get again 88.9 grams of oxygen. It doesn't matter which way you do it. The law of constant composition says that compounds contain elements in a definite ratio by mass. And it doesn't matter where you get the sample of the compound from, just that the percent by weights, the percent by masses are constant.